Hi everyone and welcome to Module 10. This is a one-week module. We're going to briefly cover reconciling non-CRF data, coding data, and reconciling these SAE and AE databases. Make sure you review all the materials in the module. Um, some of your final exam questions will come from this material. Your assignment is an individual one. I want you to use an old CoStart Adverse Reaction Coding Thesaurus to look up adverse event terms. I'm going to give you five terms to look up, and I want you to document the various terms that they map out to. So it should be simple, straightforward. Let me know if you have any questions on it. So again, we're going to be focusing on how we reconcile data that comes in um, through the clinical database and the data that comes in from other sources, what we call non-CRF or additional data, usually this data is going to be coming in from a central laboratory. So we'll talk about that process. We're going to talk briefly about coding um, and the SAE and AE reconciliation process and what data management is responsible for doing for all three of these. And then I'm going to go over the assignments. Uh, the first assignment, as I said earlier, writing a paragraph that's pretty straightforward. Doing the co-start lookup of adverse reactions might be a little harder uh, for you to figure out how to write it up. So as always, contact me if you have any questions about the assignment. So what is non-case report form data? Well, the most common types are coming in from what we call central or core labs. And in this case, it's not core like you drilled a core into something. It is that they are the core, um, the core source that all the data goes into. And what we receive from these labs in data management are data sets. We don't import those data sets back into the clinical database, but we have the clinical data sets, database data sets, and these um, central lab data sets existing in the same computer system, and we run programs to compare them, and this process is called reconciliation. And what you're looking to see is that for every patient in the clinical database, you have the associated laboratory data and for every patient for whom you have received laboratory data, that you also have that same patient in your clinical database. So you're really reconciling to make sure that you have the same patients in the data sets. So what are some common types of non-CRF data? Well, uh, you'll hear a lot about central laboratory data, and this is basically hematology, your analysis, blood, you know, your blood chemistry panels. Um, so that's your central lab. Some common central labs are LabCorp and um, Covance. You know, these, these groups basically have a tr clinical trials protocol. They contract with CROs and drug companies that are running clinical trials. You send all your lab samples to them, and then they send a data set to you so that you can reconcile to your clinical database. Uh, another very common central lab is an uh, MRI lab. Um, also, ECG labs, holter monitoring labs, you know, any place where you can have the sample read and then have a data set created on that and the data set is sent back to us. Um, also, you can think of uh, IVRS and IWRS data coming in that way, if voice recognition or web-based data coming in. This could be uh, randomization data, it could be patient diary data, it could be questionnaires. So it's really anything that's coming in through a voice recognition system or a web system. And once again, you don't actually put that data into your clinical database. You create a data set and then you compare the two. So the common data management activities to all of these are essentially importing the data in and then reconciling it, looking to see if you have the same patients in both sets of data, um, and then managing the queries that might arise while you are doing your reconciliation. So how do you do a reconciliation? Well, first let's look at the process, and then we'll look at what we actually compare. Uh, some of the PowerPoints that I've posted are PowerPoints on actually doing the reconciliation process, and I think those will give you some really good detailed examples. But for an overview, you have to define the import process. 
first. You have to agree with the central lab what the data they're sending you is going to look like, how often you're going to get that data, what the data fields are going to look like, and what they're going to be named. So you're going to define the process of importing the data. You also have to define the reconciliation process up front. And again, I know you're probably hopefully not getting sick of hearing this, but are coming to expect it. You have to define the process up front. You can't wait and write it down at the end after you've done it. Then once you have your import process and your re reconciliation process documented, you actually import the data. Then you compare the two data sets, whatever you've imported against your clinical database. And you look for differences or discrepancies between the two. And then you resolve those discrepancies either by fixing your database or fixing the central lab's data. What do you compare? Well, typically, you're looking at patient identifiers. You want to make sure, again, that both that the patients exist in both places, that you don't have any patients that are in one data set but not in another data set. Also, you're looking at visit dates. And you look at visit dates because the, um, the central labs uh, were supposed to be done at particular points throughout the, the study. And you are really looking, if you think about your visit schedule, your visit matrix, where we could say, OK, we're going to do um, blood chemistry at visits 2, 4, and 8, then you should be able to find laboratory data for each patient for their visit to 4 and 8. So you're going to compare patient identifiers and visit dates. Also, laboratory samples uh, are have to be tracked, just like we track case report form data. And what they will do, for the most part, is assign either an accession or requisition number that is a unique identifying number for that sample or that record. And you can often enter the accession number in your clinical database and then compare that as well to give you another layer of comparison. If you don't have the accession and requisition number in both data sets, then you're essentially just QCing or reconciling your patient identifiers and your visit dates. So let's talk about coding. Um, we talked about coding in some of the earlier modules where we said that essentially you get a lot of verbatim text describing concomitant medications and adverse events in medical history. But in order to analyze that data, you have to be able to quantify it. So essentially, that means you need to assign a numeric code to that verbatim text. And that um, code has to be assigned consistently. And in some cases, you need to take a large number of codes and um, distill them down to a single code. So you need to have something that's quantifiable and consistent. And essentially, that there is a numeric code that has been applied to your verbatim text. And I've got an example over here of a table that is showing the incidence of adverse events. So you can see that they are looking at the number of uh, patients who reported diarrhea, the number that reported vomiting, the number that reported otitis media or ear infections. And these are actually numbers. But you have to remember that when this data was recorded in the case report form, it might have said severe diarrhea. It might have said runny stool. Sorry, I know these are awful examples, but this is the type of data you get. So all of those descriptions of diarrhea, diarrhea needed to be rolled up into one single term so that you could account for the total number of them in the trial. So essentially, coding is assigning a numeric code to the verbatim text so that you can quantify it and analyze it. So what do we code? Well, typically, you're going to be coding medical history, adverse events, surgeries, procedures, and medications. And we actually have, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, some really common uh, dictionaries that we use over and over again for these trials so that we have consistent expectations for how we code these texts, these verbatim texts. And um, here you can see um, one of these is an ICD-9 coding up in the upper uh, right-hand corner. And you can actually see the number. Um, the top one is, I think it's like L025.11, which is an abscess of the right hand. So you can see, in this case, you can see the verbatim text and then the code that it maps to. The lower table is um, a drug table. And you can see here uh, that they have what they call an ATC code. We're not going to talk 
about ATC codes in depth, but basically I think it stands for anatomic, therapeutic, and chemical level coding. So it's a very sophisticated drill down type of code for drugs. And um, here you can see this is the code M01AX17, and then the drug that it stands for, numilicide, and um, you can kind of run down the list and see all the other codes that are assigned to these drugs. So hopefully when you look at this, you can get a sense of, of basically what I mean when I say you assign a numeric to a verbatim text. How do we code? Well, essentially, um, the site records a or reports a verbatim term. So you might hear that phrase, a reported term or a verbatim term. This is essentially exactly what the site wrote down on the case report form or entered into the EDC system. And what we do when we code is we assign that numeric which maps out to what they call the preferred term. This is the term that is preferred by the industry. So verbatim or reported is what the sites recorded and preferred is what the industry wants to use when we do our analysis. All of these codes are in dictionaries. And it used to be that you actually pulled out a paper dictionary and you flipped through the book. I remember working in offices where we had volumes and volumes of these different dictionaries. But eventually they were all put into a data set and we developed programs called autoencoders. And the autoencoder essentially um, you port out a listing of all of the verbatim terms and the autoencoder runs against them and it matches all the ones that it can match. Then a person takes a look at the ones that don't match. That's called manual coding. They manually assign a code and plug that back into the autoencoder. And you just continue running listings throughout the life of the trial. When you get towards the end of the trial, you have somebody with a medical background who will come in and do a medical review to make sure that they'll look at both the verbatim term and the preferred term and make sure that you consistently map the verbatims to the preferred terms and that you did it correctly. So this little slide shows you the verbatim term, abdominal distension, and the measure preferred term, which is also abdominal distension. Um, but then there's some that you can see where there's a difference. Um, Sorry, these all tend to be toilet issues. I know that's not so fun. Uh, I liked um, bowel urgency is the verbatim term, but defecation urgency is the preferred term, in case you ever need the preferred term for bowel urgency. I mentioned earlier that we have some common or standard dictionaries that we use in clinical trials. When I was first um, in the industry, there were several different dictionaries and multiple versions of these different dictionaries and you could you know one of the one of the biggest things you had to do at the start of a trial was work with the sponsor to figure out which dictionary they wanted to use and nowadays that's really kind of narrowed down um, we are for the most part people are using the World Health Organization dictionary to um, record uh, you know, adverse events and drugs, and then MEDRA as your overall medical dictionary. But it used to be that we had CoStart, and that's the old dictionary. It was replaced by MEDRA, but I'm going to have you go in and play around with it. It's kind of fun. Um, people still use the ICD-9 or the new version ICD-10 to code concomitant medications. Um, then MEDRA is really the big boy. Everybody most, most people are using MEDRA. MEDRA is the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. It is a um, joint international um, effort to have a single thesaurus for clinical trials. And it is maintained by an organization called the MSSO, or the I think it's called the Maintenance Service Organization. So for the most part, you're going to hear, when you are dealing with coding dictionaries, you're going to pe hear people talking about MEDRA and the WHO dictionaries, which are the World Health Organization dictionaries. And again, these dictionaries, you can still get hard copies of them, but almost everybody is buying electronic versions of them, and they're very expensive. These are not cheap. Um, they're buying electronic versions of them and feeding them into their autoencoders and doing all the coding with these dictionaries. 
We're going to talk really briefly about SAE to AE reconciliation. And I have this separate from the other non-CRF data uh, because actually you, for two reasons. One is that you actually do get an adverse event um, CRF. Uh, the, but what you have to compare it to is the serious adverse event information, which does not come into the clinical database on a case report form. However, there are a number of commercial databases that are built just to handle serious adverse events. They're called safety management systems or safety databases. And I'm going to talk to you in a second about a few of the commercial ones out there. But what you need to fix in your mind is that there is a safety database and there is a clinical database. We in data management own and maintain the clinical database. The safety group manages the safety database. But at the end of a trial, and sometimes through on, on an ongoing basis throughout a trial, we compare those two databases. And what we're trying to make certain of is all of the serious adverse events were, were pulled out of the AE database and captured in the safety database, we'll pull out the wrong term, that um, all, the, all the SAEs that were also adverse events need to have been reported to the regulatory authorities and the sponsors. And all of the um, serious adverse events should also have an associated adverse event in our clinical database. Because typically, we begin by seeing that something is an adverse event and recording it on the CRF. And then as we come to understand the severity of the reaction and the outcome of the reaction, that is the point at which it becomes identified as a serious event and a reportable event. So we, um, we do much more reconciliation work with the SAE to AE reconciliation than we did with the non-CRF data. And I've I um, have a nice PowerPoint uh, that a group did. I want you to look through on that SAE AE reconciliation process. But essentially, you're checking those demographics, not just the patient ID, but sex, gender, all that good stuff. Um, you're looking to make sure the two terms match. You're particularly interested in the onset date, when the adverse events and SAE started. That needs to match uh, the outcome. What happened? Did the patient die? Did the SAE resolve? Were they hospitalized? the date it was resolved, whether you think it was caused by the drug, and the stop and start time of the study drug so you can look. We're going to talk really briefly about SAE to AE reconciliation. And I have this separate from the other non-CRF data uh, because actually you, for two reasons. One is that you actually do get an adverse event um, CRF. Uh, the, but what you have to compare it to is the serious adverse event information, which does not come into the clinical database on a case report form. However, there are a number of commercial databases that are built just to handle serious adverse events. They're called safety management systems or safety databases. And I'm going to talk to you in a second about a few of the commercial ones out there. But what you need to fix in your mind is that there is a safety database and there is a clinical database. We in data management own and maintain the clinical database. The safety group manages the safety database. But at the end of a trial, and sometimes through on, on an ongoing basis throughout a trial, we compare those two databases. And what we're trying to make certain of is all of the serious adverse events were, were pulled out of the AE database and captured in the safety database, we'll pull out the wrong term, that um, all, the, all the SAEs that were also adverse events need to have been reported to the regulatory authorities and the sponsors. And all of the um, serious adverse events should also have an associated adverse event in our clinical database. Because typically, we begin by seeing that something is an adverse event and recording it on the CRF. And then as we come to understand the severity of the reaction and the outcome of the reaction, that is the point at which it becomes identified as a serious event and a reportable event.
So we, um, we do much more reconciliation work with the SAE to AE reconciliation than we did with the non-CRF data. And I've, I um, have a nice PowerPoint uh, that a group did I want you to look through on that SAE AE reconciliation process. But essentially, you're checking those demographics, not just the patient ID, but sex, gender, all that good stuff. Um, you're looking to make sure the two terms match. You're particularly interested in the onset date when the adverse events and SAE started. That needs to match uh, the outcome. What happened? Did the patient die? Did the SAE resolve? Were they hospitalized? The date it was resolved, whether you think it was caused by the drug, and the stop and start time of the study drug, so you can look at the uh, potential uh, chronological relationship. If there's a death, you need to know the date of death and the cause of death, and also any action taken regarding the study drug. In other words, did they take them off the study drug or reduce the study drug because of the serious adverse event? So. Um, SAE to AE reconciliation is between the safety database and the clinical database. The goal is to ensure that the SAE and AE are um, match up in the two, that for every uh, SAE you also have an adverse event in the clinical database. You will not necessarily have a serious adverse event for every adverse event you have because not all AEs are serious. Okay. I just wanted to give you the names of some of the more common commercial safety databases. Uh, one is ARIS. It's usually called ARIS Global now. There is also Argus. This is the one that I tend to see used the most. Um, Oracle Clinical had one called ClinTrace. There is also AES. And then Metadata has one that they market that is called Safety Gateway. So again, I just wanted to give you those terms in case you hear people mention them. You can go, oh, eh, that's a commercial safety database. Make sure you do the readings in this module. Um, OK, we're at the end of the lecture. And there's a couple things I want to remind you do, make sure you go into Proska and read chapters 9, 10, 11, and 26. I also want you to do all the readings and videos in this module. Remember, I take some of the exam questions from the readings as well as the lecture. You only have one assignment to submit for this module. It's a simple one. Don't make it hard. I just want you to experience um, the different types of verbatims that can map to a, a single master term. So I'm going to have you go into the CoStar Term Lookup Dictionary and look up these uh, terms, pain, fever, nausea, stool, and arthritis. And I want you to write down for me some of the um, other terms they map to. There are details for the number that, of terms I want you to record in the assignment. So look at that. Here's the link. And then there's also a link on Blackboard. As always, let me know if you have any questions. So in this case, I went into the CoStart lookup, and I typed in the text migraine. And you can either do search or show all terms. That it's fine. It doesn't make a difference one way or the other. But it will list the results. It'll tell you that migraine is the preferred term for both migraine and migraine aggravated. So I'm going to have you look up each of the five terms that I had in the previous slide. And I'm going to have you write up for me what the um, top two uh, mapping terms or associated terms were. So in my example right up here, I have migraine, colon. That was the term I looked up. And then the first two terms that relate to that are migraine, comma, and migraine aggravated. If you are confused, please send me an email, and I will try to help. OK, we have one more module after this. It's going to be a review module for the exam. So do this work and get your assignments in on time. We are almost done with the semester. <laughs>